one of the things you're going to need to learn how to do before you can really get into measuring is to use certain devices and methods. Uh, for example, you need to learn how to use a triple beam balance. This is a slightly different way of measuring mass than you're probably used to. We've used the digital balances before, but the triple beam balance is actually quite useful. It's a little low tech in that it's not electric at all, but it has the same accuracy as the triple beam balance. It does about the same amount of work. Another thing you're going to have to figure out how to do is to use a graduated cylinder correctly, both to read it as well as to use it to do something called volume displacement. And so that's one of the things that we're going to learn in this video as well. And finally, you'll need to learn how to calculate something called percent absolute error, or just simply percent error. It's a simple formula, and we'll take a look at that as well. So get your notes, get ready, and let's get going. So this is the triple beam balance. It's called a triple beam balance because it has three beams, and on these beams are some sliding weights. The beam in the back measures 10 gram increments. As I slide this weight down, you'll hear it lock into place every 10 grams. The one in the middle is every 100 grams. It's a much larger slider. And the one down here is a single gram slider, also divided up into tenths. And this one just slides freely up and down the beam. Now before you use the triple beam balance, the very first thing you want to do is to make sure that the balance is actually calibrated correctly and zeroed out. That means that when all of the weights are back here at the zero position, over here, this line on the balance arm should match up with the line on the zero on the balance base itself. If it's not, and this looks like it might be just a little off, you can adjust this slightly by using a little knob underneath the balance pan. There's a little knob that turns clockwise and counterclockwise, and it allows you to change this zeroing. Now, for the sake of this video, I'm not going to spend too much time because it can get a little time consuming to do that. We'll just assume that this is good uh, to go ahead and measure. So, you need something to measure. We're going to use Mr. Sumo Wrestler here. I got him in Japan. And we're going to put Mr. Sumo Wrestler right on the balance pan. Now you can see, because he's a sumo wrestler, he's fairly massive. And the balance arm went right up and is now sort of stuck against the top. In order to bring it back to zero, we need to slide some of these sliders, it's sort of like a doctor's scale, and get this line to come down a little bit. Now, I don't really know how much Mr. Sumo weighs or what his mass is. So I'm going to try. I'm going to start with the largest slider. I'm going to move this over one spot until it sits in the 100 spot. And that's clearly too much. The balance arm went down, went all the way down. We want it to come to zero. So Mr. Sumo does not have a mass of 100 grams. Let's see if he has a mass of at least 50 grams. Balance arm hasn't moved, so yes, he does. How about 80 grams? Still, how about 90 grams? So 90 grams is too much, but 80 grams was not quite enough. So he's somewhere between 80 and 90. Now we move the final slider. And it doesn't really matter right now uh, where we move it. We just want to get these lines to match up. So we can just kind of move it a little bit. Sometimes it helps to stop and see how we're doing. And that looks close. We can flick this a little bit back if we need to. Have it come up a little bit. Maybe just a little bit more. That looks pretty good. So how do we determine his mass? We add. There are no hundreds. There are 80 tens. It's past the two line, 82, and about one line past, maybe a little bit more. We'll talk about some specifics about reading between the lines. It's kind of important to do that. So I'm going to say that it looks like it's just a little bit past the 82.1 line, and I'm going to call that 82.11. That would be his mass, 82.11. When you're done, the most important thing about a triple beam balance when you're done is to put it back to zero. 
so that you don't accidentally mismeasure something the next time you put it on. So you take the object off the balance pan and re-zero re the sliders. So let's say that you want to measure the volume of something that has a very irregular shape like this. You can't actually calculate the volume doing length, width, area of the base, height, all that stuff because this is irregularly shaped. It's really hard to do. So we can figure out its volume by using a method called water displacement. Water displacement is a phenomena that happens when you take something and submerge it in water. The water displaces an equivalent volume to the object that was placed in it. This is why when you sit in a bathtub, uh, the water rises when you get in because the water is being displaced by you. So we're going to use that very idea to find the volume of this irregularly shaped metallic bar. And what you need is a graduated cylinder and you need to fill that graduated cylinder up part way with some water. You need to make sure that you have enough water that the object can be submerged. And you need to measure the amount of water that's in there. It doesn't matter how much is in there, but you need to know how much is in there because what we need to do is figure out how much is it going to rise when I put this object in there. Now to put the object in to the graduated cylinder, you need to do it very carefully. Slide it down the side so that it doesn't break the glass. And now the volume has increased just a little bit. So if we measured the volume before, and now we measure the volume after, and remember, look at the meniscus. Now we can take subtraction, we can do subtraction and subtract the volume before from the volume after, and the, the difference between those two will be the volume of this piece of metal. Now, of course, when I'm done, I want to make sure that I put things back the way they were so that the next person can go ahead and use them. Finally, you might want to take some values or measurements or calculated answers and compare them to what is the quote-unquote right answer. In chemistry, we call that the accepted value. It's the value that everybody kind of accepts is the right answer. Well, if you want to compare your value, something that you got out of an experiment, with the right answer, the accepted value, you can use this little calculation, which is technically called percent absolute error, but we often just shorten that to percent error. You're going to take the absolute value of the difference between the right answer, the accepted value, and your answer, the experimental value. The absolute value signs means that you'll always have a positive number here because there's no such thing as, as a negative percent, so you want to get rid of the negative sign. You take that difference and you divide it by the right answer again. And what that gives you then is the percentage of, of that right answer uh, that you were wrong. You multiply by 100 to get it into percent, and obviously you want your percent error to be fairly low. The lower it is, the closer your value is, the experimental value is, to the accepted value.